Hey, my hair is green. <laughs> Hi, hello, happy new year. It's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home skillet biscuit. And happy Saturday, the first Saturday of Bad Movies in a Beat 2022. The series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on. Happy holidays, happy new year, my birthday just passed. This is 27. <laughs> I thought I saw a wrinkle and I fucking almost, <laughs> I'm okay, I'm great, it's fine. I haven't seen you guys in so long, so I feel like there's all these things that I wanna say. Feeling a little rusty and also just awkward. I don't really know where to put my hands. And also today's video is about a subject matter that I'm not 100% comfortable talking about because I'm conflicted. And that is Michael Jackson. <laughs> it is the first Bad Movies in a Beat of 2022. I wanted to come back with a jam. It ain't, it ain't too much to jam, ain't too much. It ain't too much to me to jam. There is an endless list of bad movies, which I'm constantly adding things onto, by the way. This has been on that list for a very, very, very long time. And to some degree, because it is so like historically bad and befuddling, I figure it's only appropriate that we start the year off how my years usually are bad and befuddling. So I felt it was only time to chamona <laughs> and discuss the chalk face Flex Washington, Michael Jackson biopic, because it's just been on my list of things to do for a very long time and I've yet to get around to it. So that's what today is. Hey, happy new year. Those of you uh, who have never seen this movie, never heard of this movie, I will be taking you on the ride as I usually do so that you are not alone. I hate that song actually. That's one of my least favorite Michael Jackson songs ever. But no, in all seriousness, this movie is hellish. It is terrible. Bad if you will. But before we get into that, one thing that isn't new in the new year is bills. <laughs> Cause rent is always due, honey. There, side note, there is nothing more disrespectful. Whoa, happy new year. And then midnight, bam, rent taken out, F you. Couldn't give a bitch one extra day to enjoy, to live in this disillusionment where we think that the new year means things are actually fundamentally different. How ghetto, anyway. I say all that to say is that I, I need money, so we're sending it over to Admiral Kenny. <laughs> Take it away. Hello there, it is Admiral Kenny to let you know that today's video is sponsored by HelloFresh, America's number one meal kit delivery service that allows you to have delicious, balanced, and healthy meals sent straight to your doorstep. Whether you're just trying to save time so that you don't have to go to the grocery store, save the brain power of thinking of what to eat, or save money because you're not wasting a bunch of food, HelloFresh is the perfect way to do so. It takes the stress out of cooking because it comes with pre-portioned, pre-measured out ingredients, as well as incredibly detailed recipe cards that allows you to follow them step by step so that you can have your meal on the table and oftentimes less than 30 minutes. Cleanup is a breeze as well because after you're done chopping everything up, you can just put them in the bag and throw the bag away. If you're super lazy, pre-cooked chicken, their desserts, their garlic bread, special sides, you know, try that stuff out as well. This week we had a meal that I've already had from them before because it's so good that I was like, next time I saw it as one of the options, I immediately jumped towards it, which is the potato and corn chowder. It's so good. It feels like a hug from a grandma. The attention you get from a golden retriever from the inside out. What I'm saying is it tastes really good, but it's a great way to get out of recipe ruts, a great way to try out new things, become a better cook in general. Go to hellofresh.com and use code Kenny16 for up to 16 free meals and three surprise gifts. That'll also be linked down in the description box if you wanna check it out. So big thanks to HelloFresh for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery, baby. Ooh. All right, so the last time we were here, we watched, um, the Nutcracker in 3D, just, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God, it was, um, wow, it was remarkable. It's a movie that's kind of like a watershed. It's the life you had before you saw it and the life you have after. And somewhere in between a part of you died. Fun time though. Uh, <laughs> if you wanna check it out, that'll be uh, listed up above or you can check it out, of course, in the bad movies in a beat playlist. <laughs> Was there a Cartman You Are Not Alone cover? Why does that feel right? 
You and yay. Okie dokie, artichoke. Like I said, today we are talking about the 2004 made for TV VH1 biopic about Michael Jackson called Man in the Mirror, the Michael Jackson story. I don't know if I've ever really talked about this on here, but I was a mega fan of Michael Jackson, particularly as a child. I remember two distinct phases of my childhood. I was a huge Michael Jackson fan. Once when I was six, when they came out with the Jackson family reunion type thing, that big, it was a big phenomenon. My mom recorded it on VHS and I was just obsessed with it. I think I was becoming obsessed with him in general. I think my sister had gotten the Invincible album. I was just listening to it all the time and I was just obsessed. And then my mom was like, oh, well I have the dangerous cassette thriller tape on vinyl. It was, it was a thing. Oh, my mom bought me a DVD of all of his most prominent videos. Um, and I was obsessed with Remember the Time. Then I had a second wave that wasn't nearly as obsessive as the first one um, right after he died because I discovered more music from him and you know, that whole thing. So I, and despite that, I've never really seen many biopics of Michael Jackson. I did watch a lot of interviews of him, like general talks he did about his artistry. I found him fascinating. I truly did. And, and I wasn't alone. I don't know to what degree people who are significantly, let's say under 20, really know how big Michael Jackson was because he was larger than life in a way that's not feasible or possible nowadays. Like, like he was mystified. He was not seen as like human, really? I don't think this level of fame is, is achievable anymore. And honestly, I don't think it should be. I think it's very unhealthy for everyone involved. I think it's just a breeding ground to um, abuse people in the spotlight, Britney Spears, for instance. And it's also a way for those people in the spotlights to abuse, um, but that's a whole different conversation. I, I feel like we should dismantle, and I think we're working on that as a society, like subconsciously dismantling fame, but that's a whole other thought experiment I have going on in here. And I haven't really flushed out entirely my thoughts on that, but that's, I haven't flushed out my thoughts on Michael Jackson and I'm still making this video. So what does that say? I guess I don't, <laughs> anyway, I don't even think I knew about this movie. I learned about this movie way later because it's become like this reoccurring black meme occasionally on black Twitter. I didn't really know anything about this movie. Didn't really know what made it bad, but outside of just looking at it, it looks terrible. <laughs> you can just kind of smell how terrible this movie is gonna be. For the sheer fact that they didn't think to find another person to play him once he got vitiligo. They were like, nope, no ma'am. We'll just put Flex Washington and Shiro Nuri. <laughs> That's a sophisticated joke. <laughs> With that said, I'm not really here to really criticize the movie for being just like factually inaccurate. Cause I feel like we knew that's what we were getting when we got Casper the friendly n <laughs> playing fucking, sorry. I think we knew that already. We knew it wasn't gonna be the most accurate depiction of, of real life. I was talking about how he was kind of mystified, but this movie took that to another level. They made him into something supernatural to some degree at some point. Like he could sense omens. He had Diana Ross as like this mystical uh, fairy god mother that would pop into his head and remind him to be himself. You know, the movie doesn't particularly concern itself with being immersive or accurate, but instead it's just this whiplash inducing series of events. And each one is more hilariously jarring than the last. <laughs> like this movie is a sensory overload. It's hard to make fun of because to some degree you can't believe that people thought this was really a movie, like a real movie. It's hard to say that this movie intended to be serious is what I'm getting at. And there's so many moments in this movie that just straight up feel like parody, like uncomfortably hilarious. That again, peculiar, guilty, laughing at a funeral <laughs> type of comedy. It's hard to say whether or not this is a, that's a good thing because Michael Jackson's life is a winding road of f***ed up. Uh, one particular subject matter in regards to that, I was very curious about how they chose to handle it. It's giving, it's, it's giving mommy dearest. <laughs> you recall, I did a nearly hour long video basically saying like, yes, I'm going to laugh at mommy dearest, but it doesn't make me a terrible person. <laughs> it makes me, I don't know what it is. <laughs> there, there is something campy 
and dare I say fun with this movie. And I don't want to say that. You know, this movie, much like Mommy Dearest, deals with abuse particularly towards children. <laughs> I spent that entire nearly hour long video, half of it was just me trying to say, I'm not saying that these real life things are funny, but somehow you were able to take these very dark and disturbing concepts and turn it into this movie. <laughs> How did we get to this movie? <laughs> and that's exactly how I feel about the Michael Jackson story. With that said, I highly recommend it. It's hilarious. <laughs> so without further ado, this is Man in the Mirror, the Michael Jackson story, 2004. So, <laughs> from the first softly uttered words, <laughs> that we hear from Michael. By the age of 13, I am laid bare, shaking, weak and convulsing. It's hard to say whether or not it's so much that the movie didn't know how to not be a parody of Michael Jackson. But then when you kind of think about it, Michael Jackson himself was kind of this uncanny valley type person in general. <laughs> So maybe they had no hope just because of like subject matter in general. But the movie starts off with Michael Jackson around the age of 13, sitting outside of his trailer while his brothers and him are about to sing for the Jackson Five, looking out at other normal kids as they have a normal childhood. 13 year old Michael, again, still with the Jackson Five, hallucinates that his fairy godmother, Diana Ross, is calling him to stardom. Diana Ross, again, comes up as this sort of like mystical figure <laughs> periodically, particularly when he's going in for surgery <laughs> and just like drugged out of his mind, presumably. He imagines Diana Ross, you know, calling him forward to believe in himself, go towards stardom the way it should be. Fast forward and he releases Thriller and he becomes the single most famous entertainer on the planet, on the planet. <laughs> And though Michael was famous before, he is now a phenomenon. And he has reached a summit that arguably no man had ever reached before and certainly not a black man. Sorry, every time I'm about to go into like a serious musings about something, I always am reminded of Flex's, I keep calling him Flex Washington. His name isn't Flex Washington, it's Flex something else. But I think of him as like one-on-one -on -one dad. Flex Washington does his Michael Jackson voice and he does not do a good job. Like that that's just what it boils down to. Even prior to them just like ducking him in lead paint. Um, he just wasn't good at this. His mannerisms were awful. Michael Jackson voice is awful. All of it is so uncomfortable too. And they throw this Halloween costume of a human into a bunch of like quick succession events. It's incredibly jarring. Bam. The Jehovah's Witnesses come over and they're mad about Thriller. Bam, he has an abusive father, Joe Jackson, that makes him feel bad about his quote unquote big nose. Bam, Michael Jackson singing to the Charon. Michael Jackson had a larger than life presence. He had a larger than life life. And so I understand that they're trying to put like all of his stuff into one movie. They should have really Spencered it. Speaking of which, have y'all seen Spencer yet? Is it? It's good. I hear it's really good. Shout out to Kristen Stewart. Speaking of Kristen Stewart, I was watching some interviews with Lisa Marie Presley, who is Michael Jackson's first wife, and she reminds me so much of Kristen Stewart. It's wild. It's really weird. Like mannerisms wise, even her voice, how she talks. They're interesting. But outside of him just being bad at playing Michael, there's something just very uncomfortable about how he plays Michael. Like, don't get me wrong. If you've ever seen a Michael Jackson interview, the guy is pretty uncomfortable to watch, honestly. <laughs> He's very awkward, um, shy, admittedly very, very strange. Um, that name weird. But Flex kind of plays Michael as if he had, <sighs> Flex kind of plays Michael as if he had like developmental issues, not. Granted, Michael Jackson's upbringing was very stunting. Um, I'd imagine to some degree there's an element of him being very regressed in some ways. Kind of the lore around Michael Jackson was that he was an adult child, human Peter Pan. He didn't want to grow up. He lived this like fantastical, very childish life. And like he had video games all over the place. And I'm going to get to this later, but his home was like a theme park. And he was climbing trees well into like his forties, you know, but he wasn't incapable of having like adult conversation. Again, if you had him in an interview, he could talk. <laughs> he was like 
aware. Like he was very eloquent. He was very well spoken. Um, again, very weird. Whereas in the movie, they kind of make him as if he's like so, so regressed to the degree that he can't even really understand what's happening around him. It's a choice. <laughs> I guess it, it it softens some of the blows that are undoubtedly gonna happen and, and presents a very particularized case. It has very much an agenda, this movie. It's the 80s and he's on the set of the Pepsi Cola commercial. But Michael is getting ready to film a commercial with Pepsi Cola when there was a, an issue with pyrotechnics that resulted in Michael being burned really badly on his scalp and he was sent to the hospital. He gets a visit from Janet who refers to herself as Tink and he refers to himself as Peter as in like Tinkerbell and Peter, again, never growing old. Oh, that reminds me. When is the documentary coming out? Part one will air on January 28th at 8 p.m. on A&E and Lifetime. Okay, baby, I'm going to watch the out of that oh my god but his relationship with janet doesn't really there's so much going on in this movie that's just like a side note it's like yeah he also has a sister named janet who's also like one of the biggest pop stars in her own right Ooh, this glitter is so juicy why is it so ju ah Ooh, it's so juicy what <laughs> Hold on. So Michael goes on the victory tour with his brothers, again, the Jackson Five. And this is where he announced to Joe Jackson that he is no longer gonna be touring with the Jackson. He's going solo. At the age of 30, Michael is still living with his family at which he decides that he wants to spend all the millions and millions of dollars that he made from Thriller to buy his new dream home, which he will refer to as Neverland. Neverland is essentially this giant body of land that he turned into an amusement park and a zoo. Um, he had a bunch of exotic animals. He had roller coasters and train rides and merry-go-rounds and Ferris wheels. And many attributed it to being the replacement, the overcompensation for the childhood that he never had. He has a staff there, the cooks, the cleaners, whatever, and one of the cleaning staff brings their son. You're famous. Am I? <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> Michael's vitiligo starts to get more apparent, particularly on one of his hands. And before a large performance, I think it was that one where he did the moonwalk for the first time. They give him a glove to put on the hand where the vitiligo is starting to show, and it becomes his like, his famous one glittery sequin glove. In the movie, I guess they don't think that maybe showing what vitiligo actually looks like would be at all beneficial. They just decide to just powder him more. <laughs> he doesn't look like he has vitiligo. It just looks like he needs some lotion. His best friend is Liz Taylor, who suggests that maybe he should have some kids of his own at this point. But he's like, I can't do that. I'm only a child myself. And they present Michael again, as if he's completely unaware of how strange this behavior is. When he gets caught laying in a fort with the cleaning lady's little son and they had a sleepover the movie presents it as if when the cleaning lady leaves and takes her son that they're overreacting <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that goes on michael starts getting a bunch of surgery on his nose getting progressively more ashy in this movie diagnosably ashy chronically in need of Vaseline. This movie really treats vitiligo as if it's a condition of simply just not lotioning. <laughs> like if you wanna get rid of vitiligo, just like spit on them and shine them through like an old spoon. <laughs> Dip them in some CLR and hope for the best. What the f I hate my mind. It's just awful in here. So Michael's manager ends up warning him about spending all this money, particularly on these random children who keep coming to the Neverland Ranch. Like, it's not a good look. Stop. And Michael fires the manager because he doesn't believe in Neverland. Mind you, he has this conversation <laughs> while in a tree. <laughs> just... Sure. So Michael has a friend, a child, a 12 year old, and this child is supposed to represent the first um, court case that Michael Jackson had accusing him of inappropriate acts with a child. And this was back in 1993. This movie definitely falls into the line of thinking that it was a false charge. And this movie, you know, pretty much explicitly says that all charges against Michael Jackson, both here and the ones in 2005, 
or poppycock to villainize this already misunderstood recluse. The movie never explicitly says that these things did not happen, but it very much so leans into the thinking that the father of the child brought this case forward simply because they wanted to extort Michael Jackson. Again, Michael denies the allegations. Michael Jackson's grandpa dies from the stress of the allegations. The police come and raid Neverland Ranch looking for other forms of misconduct, evidence of misconduct. Michael is sent to rehab in order to get away from press. Michael Jackson in rehab scene should not have been funny, but it was, <laughs> okay. I mean, what's that say about ourselves, right? If Michael Jackson is with us right now. Thank you. Latoya Jackson, they put an actual clip of La actual Latoya Jackson, who is Michael Jackson's sister, uh, publicly disavowing uh, Michael Jackson, believing that he did do the things that he's accused of. The film takes the, again, the executive choice to go again, very pro Michael and very much so villainizing uh, Latoya, even though she makes some points. <laughs> Like she makes some points, bro. Uh, but you know, Michael's basically like, she doesn't believe in Neverland. Long story short, they settle before it can go to trial. So after that big hit, uh, Michael's team kind of says like, hey, you should like settle down, get a wife. Um, and he ends up meeting Lisa Marie Presley, who is Elvis Presley's daughter. They fall in love. For some reason, she's the only person on this planet that sees him as normal. Horrible montage of them falling in love, theoretically, where it's just him like doing Michael Jackson moves around. <laughs> they fall in love, they get married. They have sex. They get married and Michael is apparently disappointed that their wedding isn't the front news because OJ is driving away from the police in a Bronco threatening to kill himself after he killed his wife. Um, whole other story. Something about OJ, the thing that he's most famous for, unfortunately, other than his like acting or sports career. And at some point, you know, Lisa is just like, I think it's time to leave this marriage. She sees him playing with a water gun <laughs> and they're like, yeah, I gotta, I gotta go. <laughs> and Michael starts to think that maybe it's time to end the marriage because she don't believe in Neverland. Anyway, they get divorced. Like she leaves him because he's overworking himself and I guess because he uh, shoots water guns in this movie, at least that's the, that's the, that's the situation they paint in regards to that. He swiftly gets married again, this time to Debbie Rowe, who has his kids. Michael, now fully ashy, fully covered head to toe in midnight clown white, is now a father and trying to come back to the stage. He eventually comes back in 2001 with the Jackson 5 reunion show, which again was the show that I was talking about earlier. I don't recall the Michael Jackson, Jackson 5 reunion show coming out on September 10th, 2001. I don't recall that. <laughs> when I was six years old and September 11 happened, I didn't fully comprehend it. I remember thinking like, something happens every day. Like, why are we, <laughs> like, why are we so bent out of shape about this? They, <laughs> this is, this is, this is the most fucked up, but funny part of this movie. I'm so sorry. I will remember this forever. What's the day? Five minutes after midnight. September 11, 2001. If you laugh, we both, I'll meet you in hell. Don't you look at me like that. Do not look at me like that. We both, you on the same elevator going down, bitch. Michael has his last child, if I'm not mistaken, whom they call Blanket. Michael Jackson was weird. He was very reclusive. So you never, you like, you knew he was out there. He was like this phantom somewhere out there but like he would never do interviews. So he agrees to do an interview so that people know about Blanket. That's what they say in this movie. They say it's because he wants everyone to know that it's not weird that we named the, the child Blanket. We named the child Blanket because it's in a blanket of love. We need to take this documentary for that. That's not why he took the doc. I was literally saying earlier, I'm not gonna like nag on this movie being inaccurate, but this bothers me. That's not why he took the documentary. He took it because he had a new sexual assault allegation. He was going to like defend himself to some degree. Uh, speaking of that documentary though, the documentary, uh, he was high as a kite, <laughs> according to uh, Lisa Marie, who saw it. She was like, that man is high as, high as balls. And beyond that, it's where he 
gave the interview while in a tree at one point, said the incredibly disturbing and infamous line of, yes, he shares his bed with these random children that come to his house, but nothing sexual, but like what's wrong with sharing your bed with some random child without their parent there. That's not weird at all, you know? It's like, what? And as you can imagine, a man who has already been accused of sexual misconduct, <laughs> Hey, you just misunderstood him. And I'm like, no, he was inappropriate. <laughs> Even if he did nothing to these kids, that is still weird and still inappropriate. But this movie, as they've done the whole movie, is chalking it up to, again, him being whimsical, Peter Pan, misunderstood, yada, yada. We have another controversy, and this one I definitely remember because this was when I was around eight or so. Um, and it's when I decided to stop liking Michael Jackson for a bit because this particular scandal really bothered me as a child. And that was him hovering blanket over a balcony in his hotel in Germany. And I remember looking at like magazines that had it on the front cover and I was like, what the f is he doing? In the movie, uh, they make it again, as if Michael is so whimsical and childlike that he doesn't understand the issue at hand of him hovering a child over a balcony. They make it seem like, again, that he's not developmentally all there when in actuality, he was probably very, very high. But again, they chalk it up to the never ending cycle of Michael doing something and people just not getting him. And again, of course, in 2003 comes in the new wave of essay, child essay allegations, intoxication, false imprisonment, stuff like that. And that was in 2003. So the year right before this movie came out, which is very, very, that's a ballsy thing to do. <laughs> do this in the midst of the allegations. And basically the movie ends with Michael getting this deluge of encouragement from Diana Ross, the fairy godmother, as well as his sister, Janet, all of which are saying to believe in yourself. Michael stands on top of his car and looks into the face of his fans and tells over like voiceover that he will stand against his accusers and not settle. And yeah, that's the movie. Horror, whoa. So I have a lot to, I have a lot of thoughts. <laughs> One about the movie. The movie, it's very much so this throwaway piece of shit. It's really campy and terrible. And if you would find some fun in it, I did. If you think it sounds campy and terrible, it is. If you like campy and terrible, it's great for it. Um, the acting, the pacing, the dancing. Oh my God, I didn't even mention that. Like in between cuts, they'll have him do just these clunky, terrible Michael Jackson moves. The makeup is hilariously bad. The movie again has this odd, like supernatural vibe to it as well. I guess to, to hone in on Michael Jackson being somewhat of like this mystical recluse that we kind of hear about. We don't talk about Bruno type. And if you think that you could have a very like mommy dearest finding the, the fun in the terrible and the fundamentally awful, then it's something that I think will entertain you. Have at it. Hi, uh, it's the next day. My original taping of this video resulted in me having this long winding existential crisis about how we as a society don't really know how to feel about Michael Jackson. Or I should say, we shouldn't know how to feel about Michael Jackson, in my opinion. It didn't really articulate that very well, so I figured I'd just pop in here again. Hello, here's a new look. My hair still looks good, it's incredible. I feel like Michael Jackson dying before he could be put under the scrutiny of like a Me Too movement. He didn't have that particular social milieu. We wouldn't know if, say, Michael Jackson was still alive today and something like um, Leaving Neverland, the documentary about two men who account their abuse from Michael Jackson. We don't really know how socially overall we would consider Michael. Like there's a lot of mystery around Michael as a person, Michael in this context, the, the cases. Um, there's been some inconsistency around um, allegations, particularly people that said he didn't do something and then later say that he did, which to me makes since like a lot of people like completely discount that. Um, if you have children going, you know, being interrogated by cops, you know, I, I, and wanting to protect their abuser, that's pretty common. <laughs> like, I don't think that makes the accounts any less valid per se, but you know, okay. But I feel like a lot of people feel very definite about Michael Jackson. Like he did not do those things. And I don't feel comfortable saying that. We owe it to, 
people to at least be conflicted. <laughs> I, I did end up getting a chance to watch Leaving Neverland. One of the men kind of explain why, you know, he was very adamant, like, no, he didn't do it. He didn't do it. He didn't do it. And then eventually broke down and said that he did. Again, all of that makes sense to me. And then there's the other side of things where people say like Michael was, you know, he's a bit strange. <laughs> he's a bit strange. He's very misunderstood, you know, and with a lot of money. So he's an easy target, right, for extortion. And this 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 tale is no different than any other like very powerful man being accused of these things. These are these tend to be the kind of like two sides. It's like these people that are obviously escorting him for money. And then there's the other side that's like, no, we, you know, something took place here. That's no fundamentally any different than any other person in power being accused of such things. Um, but I have noticed that people are very like adamant, like, no not Michael. Believe all victims, but not anybody <laughs> that accused Michael. Don't feel like people feel complicated emotion around Michael enough, in my opinion. I feel like people are very adamant. In order to enjoy the things that they enjoy, do you think I wanna have complicated er emotions around Michael Jackson? As a big fan, I'm like, like, no, I don't wanna do that. Being that he's dead and he can't defend himself, he can't have his like Gail King sit down Thing, you know, R. Kelly type situation, he can't do that. So because of that, there's just this, what do we do with these emotions? And again, I feel like that's the least I could do is contemplate that thought while interacting with Michael Jackson as a phenomenon. I think I just articulated that better than I did yesterday. <laughs> I probably am still winding and going nowhere. I've been talking for so long. I just have so much to say about Michael Jackson. I really do. He's one of those like conversation pieces that I could go on in any direction. And like, damn, can I enjoy you rock my world without think? I mean, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Actually, this this last rambly segment. And I would also like to know your age in relation to how you feel as well. Cause I have a theory that people that are younger just don't really care about Michael Jackson at all, perhaps, because he's been dead for like a hot 13 years. But if you're like around my age, a little older, I'm curious if you are having the same conundrum I'm having. Anyway, if you like this video, feel free to like this video. Put your comments down below for other movies also if you want me to check out. Um, I thought this was gonna be a way lighter video. I, mm, nope, happy new year. Uh, feel free to like, comment, subscribe. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram and Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. Happy to be back and I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Your butt is mine. Prince said he is not gonna be in that song. <laughs> he was like, your butt is mine. Who's saying that to who? I'm not saying that to you and you not saying that to me. We are at an impasse. <laughs>